It's a good thing you have a good sense of humor. Okay, um, before we start our podcast scenario, there's a couple of things I want to say. And I want to contrast the U.S. beef industry to the Canadian beef industry. Although Derek did a really good job of setting up this scenario, there is or are no codes of practice for beef cattle in the United States. Um, various industry organizations have things that they think maybe we should do, but there's no teeth in it, and there are no specific laws other than cruelty laws. Um, so that's one big difference between the U.S. and Canada. Okay. So what we're going to do, for those of you who have not been here, is we're going to do a cow-calf scenario, and we're going to compare two herds. We're going to compare a Maine on Jew herd and a Red Angus herd. And you know, I'm Lena Kaiser. This is my partner in crime, Kathy Anderson. She's a shelter vet. I'm a beef vet. Um, and this is our annual thing. And for those of you who don't know anything about welfare judging, I'm going to give a little background. A bit ago, Cammie Haleski, who used to be a member of our animal science department and has moved to Kentucky because the weather's better, um, when she was studying for her PhD, developed the Animal Welfare Judging Contest Assessment. And basically, what she did, and you can look up the article, it's listed on the bottom here, was she used livestock judging. Anybody here ever done livestock judging? Oh, perfect. Yes, Jim, I know you did. Um, she used livestock judging as a model to develop a welfare judging contest. And so, if you've ever done livestock judging, you're generally given four animals of the same species and the same type and the same kind, and you're asked to place them. And sometimes you're asked to give reasons why you would place this animal above a different animal. So, anybody want to take a shout at how they would place these show heifers? Come on, Jim Sikorsky. <laughs> I switched mine and didn't have time to rewrite Fisher said he would do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Robert Fisher. We know, we know you don't do cows. Okay, so if you look at these heifers, you would compare them based on certain things that you need or you think you need for a show heifer. And the judge who placed these heifers placed them 2, 4, 1, 3. And I sent them to a different judge, and the different judge placed them 4, 3, 2, 1. And I placed them 2, 4, 1, 3. And Kathy, who doesn't really know much about cows, placed them 4, 2, 3, 1. So what's the point of this? The point is that on any given day, your perception of things would be different. And what we tell the kids in 4-H is one judge's opinion on one day of one animal. So your background and what you believe and your ethics and your social moral influence what you think is better welfare. And that's actually the reason that I put this slide here, and Susan will recognize it because I've used it before. These are two beautiful red eggs females, and I always pick one over two. Why do I pick one over two? Because one looks like one of my cows. There's no other reason. Other people pick two over one. The beetle is here just to remind us that we're now starting the scenario. <laughs> so, anyhow. These cow calf herds are virtual herds. We've created them out of a collage of other farms. And so it may be that on your farm you don't do this, but this is how we put this together for the scenario. And this is the way we're going to run through it. We're going to give you some cow calf facts because my guess is that most of you are not all that familiar with um, cow calf operations in the US. Then we're going to talk about the breed characteristics of our breeds. Then we're going to introduce the herds, describe them and their husbandry, and then you guys have five minutes to cogitate on which herd has the better welfare. Then we're going to poll the crowd, and then we're going to give reasons why we place one above two or two above one. So in the United States, there are 29 million beef cows. And that would be, I'm talking about mama cows that have calves. And all these facts from, come from the um, National Animal Health Monitoring Association data um, of various years, and they're from the 25 top beef states in the U.S. 
So the number of ranches and farms in the U.S., there are 729,000, which means that my phone is ringing, <laughs> which means that 91% um, of these herds have less than 100 cattle. And this represents 50% of all beef cows. And 75% of these herds have non-registered cattle. So we call them commercial cattle, non-registered. Um, the average herd size in the U.S. is 40,000. It's, 40, it's 40 cows. And the largest cow-calf herd in the nation is owned by the Mormon Church, and they have 44,000 mama cows. The other thing you need to know about the beef industry in the U.S. is that 72% of the farms have off-farm income which means that beef cattle is not their primary source of income. So we have a lot of small and diverse cow-calf operations in the U.S. A few more facts, just because you thought you might need some. Texas has the most cows. They have over 5 million. They have 132 operations. Their average herd size is 39, which is shocking to me. Michigan is number 28 in terms of beef cattle numbers. We have 100 and 6,000 cows with an average herd size of 16. 13, can't read. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna start the specifics of the scenario and with the breed characteristics. We should be on the other side. Yeah, okay. All right, the main Anjou breed, which is one of our herds, is a large, calm, dual-purpose breed. It's red and white and horned. It was developed in Northwest France in the 19th century. They were ported into North America in 1969, registered with the American Maine on Jew Association. The goal of the association is to preserve the original breed characteristics and to promote crossbreeding. They are registered as high and low percentage Maine, and in the U.S., many registered Maine on Jew cattle are black and old and used crossbreeding for show cattle. The Red Angus is a moderate framed beef breed. It's red and old. It was developed in the United States in 1954. The original breeding stock was selected from red-colored black Angus cattle, and red was considered an undesirable color. The first U.S. beef breed to register cattle based on performance data, the Red Angus uh, Association, and it's registered with the Red Angus Association of America. The goal was to provide commercial cattlemen with growth, hybrid vigor, and maternal genetics. They are registered based on the percent Angus and also their color, and they are too used in crossbreeding programs. Okay, so we have the Maine on Jew and the Red Angus. Notice how pretty the Red Angus is. <laughs> Actually, that is not my cow. It is someone else's cow. Her name is Amy Grace. Okay, so this is the way we're going to do this. We're going to give you a herd overview. We're going to talk about the family and the owners of the herd, um, how the cows are bred, calving and calf care, weaning, nutrition, veterinary care and herd health, biosecurity, marketing, and culling criteria. <clears throat> so in terms of herd overview, the Maine on Jew's herd's goal is to preserve full blood Maine on Jew genetics. And as you will recall, that means red, white, corn, and big. They have 75 full blood Maine on Jew cows, 15 replacement heifers, five bulls, and a goat. Okay, and the Red Angus herd, uh, the goal was to provide Red Angus bulls to commercial herds. They have 500 Red Angus cows, 125 replacement heifers, and 20 bulls. The Maine on Jew herd is owned by a third generation Centennial farm in the Midwest. Family includes grandparents, parents, and three adult children. They have 100 acres with additional more than pastures. All the labor is provided by family members, and the parents and children have off-farm jobs. The Red Angus Farm is a fifth-generation ranch in the Midwest. The family consists of three generations with eight adults and six teenagers. There are 500 acres owned and an additional 1,000 acres are leased. The labor is provided by the family, a higher couple, and day laborers as needed. The, the mother and two other spouses have off-farm jobs. In terms of breeding, the Maine on Jew heifers are exposed to a calving ease Angus bull. Cows are bred only by artificial insemination, AI, to full blood bulls. Full blood semen is imported from France or from their own herd bulls. Cows with excellent breed character are flushed to obtain embryos. Embryo recipients are full blood cows that reside on the farm. The Red Angus, the heifers are bred AI to calving ease bulls. 
Those that are not pregnant after artificial insemination are sent to the feedlot. For the cows, some are bred AI with natural service cleanup, and others are bred by natural service only. Semen from the, for AI is obtained from other farms or from herd bulls, and elite cows are flushed. Embryo recipients are cows that are either on the farm or those from the embryo transfer facility. In terms of calving and calf care, calving season for the main on June is December to February. Cows calf the pens in the barn. There's a barn camera that allows constant observation of close-up cows. Calves that do not get up in nurse are given colostrum and put in a calf form. Calves are pins dehorned and given oral meloxicam for pain control. Calves are tagged for identification, given selenium and vitamin A, D, and E, and the navel is dipped in iodine. Bull calves that are not full blood made on June, or not considered genetically superior examples of the breed, are banded at birth and given meloxicam. Calf loss is approximately one per year. Calving season for the Red Angus herd is from March to April. Cows calve outside on fresh pasture. Clo uh, Close-up heifers are checked every four hours. Um, cows are checked twice daily. Calves that do not get up and nurse are taken to the barn and bottle fed, and then that cow is shipped. Twins, if there are twins, one calf is bottle fed. Calves are tagged for identification, given intranasal respiratory vaccine, and navel dipped. Bull calves that did not get up and nurse are banded at birth, and the calving loss is less than 1% per year. In terms of weaning, and Derek said this up really nicely for us, calves are weaned between four and eight months of age. They're preconditioned, which means they're vaccinated, dehorned, castrated, and acclimated to the feet up before weaning. And in this herd, we use two-stage no weaning. The Red Angus herd, the calves are weaned at seven to eight months of age. They too are preconditioned, so they receive vaccines, the castrated, and acclimated to the feet before weaning. Um, they are fence, fence line weaned. In terms of <coughs> me, nutrition, the main engine herd rotationally grazes from May to October. During the winter months, they're fed grass, alfalfa, and clover hay. They have free choice mineral tops. Calves and yearling heifers are given 14% protein pellets. There are automatic waters in every pasture. The Red Angus herd is on pasture from March to November. From November to March, they are grazed on corn stalks, fed corn silage, hay, and protein cubes. They do have access to free choice loose mineral. Calves and sale bulls are, sold, are fed 14% protein pellets, and the water is a gravity fed tanks in each pasture. In terms of herd health and veterinary care, cows and bulls are vaccinated annually for respiratory diseases with a kill vaccine, also vaccinated for lepto and turbulence. Calves are vaccinated and boosted with modified live vaccine. The veterinarian protects the cows that are bull bled, bull bred, and the ET cows are checked at 45 to 90 days. A veterinarian is available for sick cow work, and cows that need a C-section are transported to the university. Cows, heifers, and bulls are body condition scored two times a year. Body condition score of less than five in animals are separated and fed up. Cows and bulls from the Red Angus herd are vaccinated annually for respiratory disease with a modified live vaccine and also for trichomonas. Calves are vaccinated and boosted with modified live vaccines. Veterinarian ultrasounds all cows for pregnancy in the fall. Open cows are shipped. Veterinarian does C-section on the farm, so not off. Uh, the DBM is available for sick cow work. Body condition score is done in the fall, and those animals that are thin or the older pregnant cows are put in a separate group with the first calf heifers. In terms of biosecurity, the red egg, the the manager herd is closed, which means once an animal leaves the farm and is commingled with other animals, it does not return. All embryo transfer work is done on the farm. Wildlife, which includes deer, raccoon, possum, and birds, are kept out of the feed, and have heart traps are used in the barn. Rodent control is by working barn cats. Sorry, I couldn't help <laughs> <laughs> the Red Angus herd, um, they may buy superior bulls or females from other ranches. Um, those animals are tested for BVD and Yoni's disease prior to purchase. 
Recipient cows from the embryo transfer facility are kept in a separate area until they calve and are used again as recipients or they are shipped. Invasive species are dispatched. In terms of marketing, heifers, cows, and bulls are sold by a treaty or at retails or expos. Select bulls are sold at bull test stations. Prior to the sale, all bulls receive, receive and must pass a breeding soundness exam. All animals that are sold are guaranteed breeders, and if they fail to breed, they are replaced or refunded. For the Red Angus herd, the annual sale on the farm is for 150 to 200 bulls, and they're typically somewhere between 12 or 18 months of age. Some heifers and red cows are also sold. All the animals are guaranteed. Sale bulls are judged on pedigree, temperament, structure, genomic evaluation, and passing the breeding soundness exam. Bulls that do not meet the criteria are given lidocaine and malaxicam and night cut and then sent to a feedlot. In terms of culling criteria, open cows and cows with temperament health and reproductive issues are shipped directly to slaughter. Bulls are shipped directly to slaughter. Calves sired by Angus bulls and those not showing acceptable breed characteristic are transported two miles after weaning to a grass fed wheat operation. For the red angus herd, open cows and cows giving birth to twins or calves that do not immediately get up and nurse are shipped directly to slaughter. Castrated bulls not meeting sale criteria are either shipped directly to slaughter or fed out or freezer eat. Castrated calves and heifers are shipped 25 miles in a group after weaning to a custom feedlot. Okay, so now, in the past, if you've been here, you know that we've done the working rehome horse scenario and the bucking versus show bull scenario and the Great Pyrenees versus the bulldog scenario. And this year, we decided we were going to not do an individual animal, we were going to do a herd, um, which I think is applicable not only to cattle operations, but also to shelter operations. So when you're looking through this and trying to decide which herd has the better welfare, look at it from a herd perspective. Um, and you now have five minutes to cogitate. Can I say something that some people might not realize that they bred those first calf pepper being and juice to an Angus bull because they have small calves that are delivered easily. Whereas if they had bred them to the main and juice bull, they'd have the full calves that were 100 pounds plus. That's exactly true, Jim. Did everybody hear that? Okay, so the reason that the main and juice herd breeds their first calf heifers to black Angus bulls is because you can get high accuracy calving ease with black Angus and that decreases dystocia and problems with your heifer. So it, basically for a heifer calf, which is a, a young female who has not calved before, you want them to A, have a good experience with, the, with calving and B, not need a C-section or have a dystocia or other issues. So um, the resulting calves from that cross would be black because black is dominant and in this herd those black calves would go directly to the feedlot. Anybody else want to say anything that I've left out? Okay, five minutes. Talk amongst yourselves. We will. <laughs> Turn off your mic. Yes, I do.
mentioned with that two-stage nose flap cleaning is you've got to handle those calves. You're getting a lot of stress handling and putting in the nose flaps. So, you know, you kind of got some stress there. Um, one thing that wasn't um, mentioned, you mentioned the owner's demographics, but not their temperament. Like, <laughs> we know some farmers that are quite expressive and loud, and their calves are crazy. And then you know, we, I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, and, and then we know some other, you know, just quiet, and they can do anything with them. So, you know, just because there's three, both three generations doesn't tell me about their personality. So That's a good point. Always putting you on the spot. You do do the no slap. I do do no slap. Will you talk just a little bit about your experiences with it? Um, yeah, I talked to Derek about 10 years ago, or maybe longer, um, about no slapping, and he thought I should try it, and so I did. And yes, this, you have to run the calf, calves through the shoot twice. Now the good thing about that is, I like to run the calves through the shoot, so they get used to being run through the shoot, they get used to humans. And so basically, I took the flaps out of my weaned heifers by myself last weekend because um, there was nobody else around. So they were really easy to work with. So I know that farmers often say, oh God, you gotta run them through the shoot twice. It's actually, if you do it calmly, it's a good experience for, for you and the calf. Um, you need to leave them in between seven and 10 days and they, they're they kind of interesting because calves will twist around and try to get at the other and all the calves I've weaned, I've had one who was able to nurse around um, the flap. And I paid special attention to my cows because the calves are going to leave. And I want my cows to not have a bad experience. And so the, cow, the cows are a little vocal when the flaps go in, but they're no more vocal than if you were to wean them in a different way. And I think it's because their udder is full and they're uncomfortable. Um, once we do this two different ways of when I Tuesday to make my steer calves, I now take the flaps out and they go to wherever they're going so they don't stick around in the farm. Um, reports from the people that get them is that they may be vocal for 24 hours, but it's nothing like a rough weaning where they may be bawling for seven to 10 days. Um, my heifers are now in the barn. The cows can still have access to them, look, to look at them, and it's um, anything else I'm supposed to say about two stage winning? I like it. Um, and yes, they have to go through the shoot twice, but I think it's good for them. I feed them. What I'm struggling with Lena talks is sort of really gets down to the, the whole principle of animal welfare, which is first off, what you've already addressed, Judy, which is handling. You know, handling is such a significant component, and it's a component we did not look at in this scenario. But the second thing is, um, as part of that is sort of the desensitization um, to the process, to the actual shoot process. The third thing that I know from lots of nights of Lane and I talking on the phone about lots of different things is that there's some pre-selection going on too to the, the cattle that, are, that do stay on her farm in terms of behavior soundness. And I think, again, that's a critical thing that all of us that work with herds, whether it's herds of dogs, like Dr. Cece and Dr. Fisher and myself work with or herds of cattle, or herds of sheep, um, or working with the exotics that we have to take into account. Yeah, I think that's a an excellent point. And if you as a veterinarian or a veterinary student out there, I've gotten to the point where my clients, if I say to them, that cow is crazy and she needs to go, they should. Because there's no reason to keep crazy. Um, it's dangerous, particularly when crazy is that big. And it's a shift in culture, and you have to work hard to get farmers to recognize there are different ways to do things, and you can do it in a low stress manner. Erin, you want to say anything? Yeah, you! <laughs> Okay, we won't pick on you because you're talking chickens unless you want to talk. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Whatever you want to say. What we like about these scenarios is the, it's 
finding out what you think, which is often kind of something that we hadn't thought about when we created them. Um, So one of the first things I admitted to was having a huge bias because I know Lena, I know what her herd is like, I know her practices. So I really wanted to pick that main on Jew herd anyway. Uh, so it was it was hard for me to see the how well the red Angus was doing a little bit. They're both good scenarios, both groups of animals I thought had excellent welfare, just different ways of getting to potentially a similar goal. Thanks. Chicken Sniffer. Hi. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Janice Sigbert. I'm an associate professor in animal science, animal behavior, and welfare. I just came back from organizing the intercollegiate animal welfare judging competition in Iowa this past weekend. We had 150 students, including teams from vet med at MSU, undergrad from MSU, and grad from MSU. The vet med team did exceptionally well. So, let me just say that first. Yay. <laughs> Carlton is here who, who helped bring that, that team to uh, the judging competition. And so we looked at farmed catfish, racing greyhounds, meat rabbits, and pigs in a live format. So I had a very hard time with this, partly because I don't know what is happening, how the animals are responding. Because I thought there were a lot of good input metrics, but I don't know what happens to the cows, except for those mortality rates for calving loss. And if you calculate 1 per 75 versus 1 per cent of 500, slightly higher at the main engine farm. That's 1 per 75. One, in, 1 out of 75 is 1.3%, 1 and 1% 1 out of 500 is 640. Wait, wait, for the main engine, but it's 1 out of 75 cattle? Less than one percent. Right, so it's higher at the main and farm. That's what I said. I just can't do math right now because I'm totally sleep deprived. So, so for me, one of the biggest things I want to look for is how the animals respond. So I, I like knowing what the inputs are, but even more important to me is what's the output. So things can look good on paper, but I have a hard time knowing how that turns into practice and unless I see the animals. So I struggled with this. I was like, oh, no. Well, no, some of the things I can look for, so weaning, like um, Dr. Haley mentioned vocalizations and steps and things like that. So I started making notes about what things I would like to see, like dystocias, how many dystocias were there, how many calves, um, how many animals were born by C-section, how many calves failed to thrive and get up and nurse, how many calves did or didn't get colostrum. Um, yeah, morbidity, rates of gain, especially after, after weaning, those could be good things, or after transport as well. So yeah, there, there's some really good metrics of the body condition scores for the nutrition program. So how do those end up? Are they uniform? Are they variable? Things like that. So so yeah, I love all the detailed information on the management. And then I was just like, no, I want to see the cows. I want numbers. No, I want to see the cows. Anyway. Good input. Thanks, Jess. Anybody else have anything they want to talk about? Jim Sikarski, anything you want to say? OK. What we've done in the past is we've actually given reasons where we say I place one over two because, but we we decided based on our perceptions that, and we decided based on comparing practices to the overall U.S. beef herds that both of these herds did a pretty good job. Um, in fact, if you kind of look through, there were asterisks, and some of those asterisks were for me to remember, for example, about 60% of calves in the U.S. are abruptly weaned, and neither of our herds did that. Um, about 25% of calves in the U.S. are born with horns, and half of them are dehorned. So, when we look at the overall U.S. statistics, these are two pretty darn good herds, even without metrics. So what we ended up doing, 
instead of giving reasons, was looking at these herds. They're two very different herds. Um, they're different in size. They're different in uh, when they when they calve, how they're managed, etc. And we thought that they were pretty equivalent in terms of breeding, calf watch, calving area. In the U.S., there's a, hard, a huge number of, of um, herds where pregnant cows are not even looked at once a day. So um, the fact that we have heifers looked at every four hours in the Red Angus herd and the Cameron and the Manjoo herd, that's a good thing. That's a progressive thing. Um, calving area depends on, if you're going to calve in the winter, you need to have a barn. But they do. If you're going to calve in the spring, you can calve a pasture. We thought the calving seasons were based on what it is their goals were. Um, and if you're selling 12 to 18 month old bulls, you can calve in the spring. Um, both had low stress weaning. Both in nutrition was pretty equivalent. Herd health was pretty equivalent. Transportation, if you compare the, the manager of herd, there are calves going to the feedlot two miles. The other was 25 miles. Compare that to the average number of miles feeder calves are moved. That's nothing. 25 miles is nothing. So both of those are totally reasonable um, and actually pretty good. We faulted the main Anjou herd because they were born horned and had to be pulled or dehorned. Um, and Red Angus, as you may or may not know, are, are or should be genetically homozygous pulled. Um, but if you want to maintain a breed characteristic, that's something you're stuck with. So they dehorned in a fashion that was reasonable, taste dehorning it one day with um, meloxicam for pain control. We faulted the Red Angus herd for biosecurity since they had embryo transfer uh, recipients on their farm and they bought animals. Um, when we got to castration, it was a little iffy because you ban a calf at one day of age and give it meloxicam, that's probably okay. The science would say that's okay. If you're raising bulls, you need to know or you need to be willing to take a bull calf who doesn't have the temperament or structure or whatever characteristics you want, you have to be willing to cut them at an older age. They did it with lidocaine, they gave them a lox camp. Is that perfect? No, but it's way above standard of care in this country. So we thought they were pretty equivalent. Do you want to add anything? And again, um, what I'm struck with here is that uh, when we're looking at these, uh, taking the species out of it, what, what I saw as the non B person in this is that they were both elite herds. They were herds that were operating well above what, what we would consider standard of care. And so for that reason, uh, this, to be quite honest with you all, we set this scenario up so that there would be no differences really, when it was all said and done. Uh, we wanted you to, to question this. And of course, we do that with, with every scenario that, that we work on. But this one, even more so than the others. We wanted to sort of raise the consciousness beyond one herd versus the other, but really focus on excellent animal welfare and, and, and by the definition that we have now. Now, do I expect the definition of animal welfare to change? We know it is. But certainly, for, for the current definition for beef cattle, these both would, I, in my estimate, be excellent. I think I have to agree with that since I helped create it. Um, well, she did create it. And the other thing that I thought is that we know that most veterinarians are small animal veterinarians. And we also know that many of them have no background in beef um, or in cattle. And yet, Veterinarians are the people that people are going to ask questions about. So, as a way to talk about beef cattle, which I do anytime, anyplace, anywhere, I thought it might be fun to hand over a few little facts so that when people ask you questions about beef, you have some knowledge about it. So, anyway, thank you very much. Oh, wait, question. Hmm. Um, I think the U.S. cattle industry is made up of X number of 
people with X number of thoughts about how to do things. Um, they're very much independent thinkers and they don't want to be told what to do. Um, and if they've done things in a certain way for so long, it's very hard to get them to change. So my short answer to your question is probably not. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed is that, at least with my clients, if they come to my farm and see what I do and see how I work my cattle, then they will go home and they will use it. Um, and so we can use, just by example, of how we do things either on our own farms or at other people's farms, we can sort of subliminally train people how to improve their animal handling and their animal welfare. Um, so my goal is sort of to improve cattle welfare one cow at a time, and I just keep plodding along. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a tough road. Anybody else? Don't forget there's ice cream and juice if you want ice cream and juice. Uh, we thank you very much. If you have suggestions for scenarios in the future, um, when you fill out your uh, evaluation of the conference, let us know. We're always willing to tackle something.